I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare. Series 1, Chapter 5, Shakespeare's Characters. Today I want to make a few points about Shakespeare's characters. As I pointed out in Chapter 1, Session 3, when I talked about universal realism, one of the elements of Shakespeare's greatness is his ability to make characters both believable as real people and, at the same time, universally significant. And in Chapter 4, Session 4, I talked about Shakespeare's use of the technique C.S. Lewis called variation to achieve a similar unity of poetic splendor and realistic speech. Now I want to emphasize that every character in Shakespeare is meant to be taken both as believably real and, at the same time, as representative of a kind of person or attitude, a part of the self, or a universal principle that is meaningful to any human being. The degree of realism of a character will partly depend on the context, what kind of play it is, comedy, history, tragedy, satire, or romance. For example, the characters in a history play will generally be more realistic, more literally believable, than those in a late romance. We are meant to believe literally that Richard II was a real man, a king of England, who actually lived and was deposed by Henry IV. When it comes to Prospero's magic in The Tempest, we must suspend our disbelief a little more. We must believe that Prospero is what a virtuous magician would be like if there were such a man, and, at the extreme, we are not meant to believe that Ariel and Caliban ever did or could literally exist, but within the confines of the play, we certainly must and do believe in the particular reality of this airy spirit and this earthy monster. We are persuaded that if there were such an island as Prospero's containing creatures like Ariel and Caliban, they would speak and act as Ariel and Caliban do. Each character is to be taken seriously as really existing for the purposes of the kind of play it is. In all cases, however, the characters are meant to be taken as both psychologically convincing particular people and representatives of more general concepts. In different ways, Richard II and Prospero both embody the universal problem of the relation between human power and moral responsibility. Ariel is both himself and a representation of the part of the human spirit that longs for freedom from physical confinement. Caliban is both himself and an embodiment of the human being's lower natural passions and of their potential for depravity and redemption. The character Falstaff never actually existed in history, but whenever he is on the stage in the Henry IV plays, we certainly believe in the absolute particular reality of this fat, witty, hilarious, indomitable man, and we cannot imagine the world ever existing without him. At the same time, we recognize him as the world's greatest fictional embodiment of dishonorable self-indulgence. Now let's think a little about the moral quality of Shakespeare's characters the good, the evil, and the mixed. Shakespeare was an astute enough student of human character to know that most people are neither all good nor all bad, but mixed, and the majority of his characters reflect this truth. The character of Hamlet is filled with admirable qualities, but he nonetheless succumbs to a terrible temptation. It is his flaw, its consequences, and its purging that make up the central drama of the play. In a lighter vein, the same is true of Catherine in The Taming of the Shrew. Apart from her obvious beauty, she has many wonderful qualities that are obscured by her shrewishness until they are liberated when her bad attitude is altered by Petruchio's commitment to ensuring her happiness. In The Tempest, even the monster Caliban, son of the devil and a witch, would-be rapist, murderer, and usurper, has in him the possibility to be healed of his evil will and to seek for grace. Neither is the mixture of qualities in a character always a matter of his or her changing from one sort of person to another, though that does happen. Sometimes the particular mixture of qualities in a character is constant. In Antony and Cleopatra, 
Antony is a noble Roman drawn to abandon his soldierly calling by the attractions and the wiles of the great seductress Cleopatra. The play is filled with his wavering from Egyptian thoughts of love to Roman thoughts of duty and back again, even until the last moments before his death. And all through the same play, Cleopatra is by turns witty, sarcastic, petulant, girlish, violent, sweet, plotting, lying, humble, queenly, traitorous, faithful, self-abasing, self-exalting, and more. That changeability is the only constant in her character until her final alteration, death, puts an end to it, though not to our memory of it. King Lear is a remarkable combination of petulant self-will and magnificent kingliness. The potential of Beatrice and Benedict to love one another is slowly revealed through their witty battle of mutual insults. Because Shakespeare was so great a portrayer of the subtleties of human character, we are tempted to take it for granted that every one of his characters is equally morally complex. This, however, turns out to be a mistake. A very important, and too often denied, fact for modern readers and audiences to know about Shakespeare's characters is that Shakespeare meant some of his characters to be really and truly and simply good, and that his audience found such goodness believable. For several reasons, we have a harder time with believing that they are good. First of all, as I said, many Shakespearean characters exhibit mental and moral complexity, so that we are tempted to assume that all do. But there are two additional major reasons why it is hard for us to believe in the simple goodness of his good characters. The first is universal. All of us know that we ourselves are not really and truly good, or not thoroughly good yet. Depending on your own spiritual belief, you will probably agree that most or all human beings are imperfect or flawed or limited or laboring under illusions or fallible whether because we are incompletely evolved, or because we are, in biblical terms, fallen, or because of a corrupting society, as Rousseau preached, or for some other reason. Each of us knows that not all our motives are pure, unselfish, kind, and virtuous. This was as true of Shakespeare's audience as it is of us, and Shakespeare knew it very well. As a result of this inner knowledge, Every one of us has reason to doubt that anyone else's motives are totally pure and good. Insofar as we judge them by our awareness of our own mixed motives, we tend to doubt the reality of any character presented to us as exemplifying pure goodness. This is especially the case when, like Shakespeare, an author strives to make his character believable as a real person. The second reason for our doubt of the goodness of even apparently good characters in drama or fiction is our own modern ideas about psychology. The tremendous influence of Freudian ideas upon our thinking in the last hundred years has caused us to assume that every apparently good motive has its roots in the unsavory swamps of the unconscious. The ego may pretend to virtue, but we have been persuaded that the selfish id is the real source of our choices. Add to the above reasons the pleasure we all take in seeing through others' pretenses, in spotting rationalizations, in not being fooled, and add as well the proliferation in the news and social media of dirt about people once thought to be above suspicion. The result is an age that finds it almost impossible to believe that any character on the stage is really good. As my great teacher said, in our age we find it impossible to believe that anything is or can be innocent. We are always therefore second-guessing a good character, always reading into the author's intentions an underlying irony or moral critique or psychological wrinkle however approving we may be of the character's external behavior and words. With most modern authors, who are equally influenced by these disillusioning forces of our age, we are usually not wrong to be skeptical. The authors write their plays and movies expecting us to be so. In Shakespeare's time, however, things were different. 
Not that Shakespeare could not portray mixed or ulterior or unconscious motives, false pretenses or rationalization. He could indeed, as in the hypocrisy of Richard in Richard III, or of Worcester in Henry IV Part I, or of Goneril Regan and Edmund in King Lear, or in the self-realization of Gertrude in Hamlet, or of Inabarbus in Antony and Cleopatra. But at the same time, Shakespeare and his audience believed that true and thorough goodness was possible. They held this belief not only because, like each of us, they probably all knew at least one person whom they would call good, even though they saw that person from the outside. They believed people could be truly good also because the Christian religious tradition they shared taught them that there had been, and were still, saints in the world, though many might be unknown as such, and that Jesus, representing the perfection of God incarnated in a man, had set an example of a good life which, in theory, it was possible to follow. So, for Shakespeare and his audience, the picture of a person saying or doing the right thing for the right reason at the right time was not necessarily assumed to be a falsification of reality or a hoax. Such a portrayal was exciting and pleasing because it confirmed the reality of the audience's belief in the possibility of human virtue, even in trying circumstances. As a result, we make a serious mistake if we are always striving to find unsavory motives and self-delusions in Shakespeare's good characters. For example, when King Lear, wanting to evoke flattery, asks his daughter Cordelia the loaded question, What can you say to earn a third more opulent than your sister's? We lose the meaning of the moment if, when she answers nothing, we allow ourselves to think she is being coy or proud, or superior, or any other unsavory thing. The dramatic significance lies in her speaking the simple truth, her only firm foundation in the face of the hypocrisy around her, and her only hope of breaking through her father's destructive self-delusion. She is being simply honest and good, though she correctly fears that doing so will get her into trouble, and the good character Kent confirms our judgment of the rightness of her response. Another example. When the surprisingly wise jailer in Cymbeline says, I would we were all of one mind, and one mind good, that's Act 5, Scene 4, lines 203 to 204, it is tempting for modern audiences not to take him seriously. Who really can believe someone who actually says such a thing? But in fact, he is expressing an honest wish, though, as he says, he would lose his income if it came true. When we allow ourselves to believe him, we discover that his simple words articulate the very wish that the play has produced in the audience and that the play's ending rewards. Of course, there are many characters in Shakespeare who present themselves as good, but really are not so. But Shakespeare makes sure we recognize them as such. King Lear thinks he's doing the right thing, but Shakespeare gives us plenty of evidence to make us realize he isn't. Iago seems to Othello to be totally honest when we know from his soliloquies that he is totally the opposite. But though such characters are meant to be fooling the other characters in the play, and perhaps themselves, they are not meant to be fooling the audience. The audience is clearly let in on the false appearance. Where Shakespeare makes a good character speak words of goodness, do acts of goodness, and be recognized as good by other good characters, we are simply to believe that the character is good. Good does not mean shallow or uncomplicated or dull, and that's part of Shakespeare's amazing accomplishment in inventing good characters. He makes them both good and believable, a very satisfying theatrical accomplishment if only we will let ourselves trust that Shakespeare means them to be good when there is no specific evidence that tells us we are to think otherwise. So a rule of thumb is this. If you want to get the meaning Shakespeare means the play to have, you must believe that a character really means what he or she says 
so long as Shakespeare gives you no explicit reason to think otherwise. Where Shakespeare wants to complicate a character's psychology with hidden agendas or ulterior motives or rationalization, he will make the complication explicit and clear. As Hamlet says at Act 3, Scene 2, Lines 141 to 142, about actors in a play, the players cannot keep counsel. They'll tell all. They exist to do so. Evil characters are far easier for us to believe in because we know from the inside what it's like to be bad, at least a little. Shakespeare's evil characters can be as thoroughly evil as any in literature. Richard III, Macbeth, Iago, Goneril. But even though that is so, we can recognize bits of ourselves in them, a recognition that gives authenticity to the extremity of their evil desires and deeds. Have we ever wanted to be captain of the team or CEO of the company, even though we know another player or a colleague is more competent? That choice is called envy. Have we ever pretended to like someone we were planning to dump or publicly agreed with opinions that in private we deplore? That's called hypocrisy. Have we ever been tempted to disrespect our parents because we know better than they or complained about an inheritance smaller than we expected? That's called ingratitude. Since most of us have been tempted by such thoughts, we have known, if only for a moment, what it felt like to be Richard III, Macbeth, Iago, or Goneril. When we see or read the plays they appear in, we know that their temptations and the potential to make evil choices are in us too. In addition to the moral qualities of a character, good, bad, or mixed, there are other qualities determined not by choice, but by nature. In Act 2, Scene 2, lines 319 to 325 of Hamlet, the prince mentions the actors, he calls them players, who perform the roles of the various stock characters that make up a typical play of the period. Along with the king, the adventurous knight, the lover, the clown, and the lady, he mentions the humorous man. By this he does not mean a comedian or a funny man. He means the type of character who suffers from the excess of one of the four humors of medieval and Renaissance physiology, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. I'll go into more detail about the four humors in Series 1, Chapter 7. These interior substances are partly fluid and partly spirit, sort of like, say, our image of adrenaline. A good balance in the proportions of these humors results in a well-balanced character, orderly in himself and in his general relations with the world. But when one or another of the humors is excessive, the result is that one aspect of the character's personality and behavior becomes to a degree exaggerated. In extreme cases of an excess humor, the character may reach the point of being antisocial and even self-destructive. Jaques, or Jacus, or Jakes, in As You Like It, is an example of a humorous character suffering from an excess of black bile called melancholia, from melon meaning black and coli meaning bile, producing the dark and depressed attitude toward things called melancholy. Sir John Falstaff, in Henry IV, Part I, is an example, among many other things, of a man exhibiting excess blood which produces a sanguine personality, from sanguis, meaning blood, that is, jolly and red-faced and fat, like Santa Claus. In the same play, Hotspur exemplifies the man possessed by excess yellow bile, called choler, who is therefore choleric, short-fused, flying into intemperate rages. Shakespeare always makes more of the humorous character than a mere stock figure, but in many of his plays, the type is easily recognizable. Other examples of humorous characters are Don John in Much Ado About Nothing and Parolus in All's Well That Ends Well. At the very end of Twelfth Night, the morally healed Orsino says about Malvolio, who has run off in a vengeful rage, pursue him and entreat him to a peace. 
in hamlet close in date to twelfth night the prince in the speech mentioned earlier promises that the humorous man shall end his part in peace this echo entreat him to a peace and shall end his part in peace provides rather explicit testimony that malvolio is to be thought of as the elaboration of a stock humorous character shakespeare's characters are of course depicted for us in the words they say and in the things they do but in addition as dramaturge diana maddox stressed our image of characters is significantly built up by all that is said about them by other characters to take only one example in king lear kent's words about cordelia at act one scene one lines one eighty two to one eighty three confirm our impression that she is good the gods to their dear shelter take thee maid that justly thinks and hast most rightly said the play confirms that kent's words too are to be trusted because he himself is good as we know not only from his own words and actions but also from what others say about him ah that good kent act three scene four line one sixty three oh thou good kent act four scene seven line one he's a good fellow act five scene three line two eighty five awareness of this element in dramatic characterization is invaluable for discerning meaning in shakespeare's plays it is an especially important principle for actors in shakespeare's plays who will find a lot of help in learning how to play a particular role not only from the character's own words but from all that is said about the character by the others another principle to be aware of is that characters can change we should not assume that a character who begins bad must end up good or that a good character must inevitably go bad but neither should we assume that the qualities of a character are always fixed and can never change shakespeare and his audience believed that the thinking and behavior of human beings could be altered by the free will by the influence of divine grace and revelation by the force of circumstances by the arguments of others by love or hate or change of fortune or sudden inexplicable affections and by the near approach of death will catherine's shrewishness be corrected will orsino ever get over his sentimental attachment to olivia will lear learn his lesson will edmund repent in time will falstaff the human potential to change is part of what keeps us on the edge of our seats in a shakespeare play now let's take a look at the very rich subject of foils in Shakespeare's plays. Most people who have studied even one play by Shakespeare have been taught the word foil. English teachers are always pointing out that this character is a foil for that one. They aren't wrong, but Shakespeare uses foils in a more complex way than many realize. The word foil comes from the Latin folium, meaning leaf, and came to be applied to metal that is beaten till it is flat and thin like a tree leaf or a leaf of paper, as in aluminum foil. Such metal foil, usually gold or silver, was used as background in the settings of jewels to contrast with the gemstone or to brighten it by reflecting light back through it, especially if the gem was of paste rather than precious stone. Because of this function of metal foil in setting off a jewel by contrast, the word came to be used as a metaphor for anything that sets off something else by contrasting with it. So the word passes into theatrical usage to mean any character whose characteristics bring another character into sharper focus. As Hamlet says at Act 5, Scene 2, lines 255 to 257, I'll be your foil, Laertes. In mine ignorance, your skill shall, like a star in the darkest night, stick fiery off indeed. He is punning on another meaning of the word foil, that is, a blunted fencing sword. Hamlet's supposed lack of skill in fencing with foils will make Laertes' mastery shine the brighter by contrast, just as the dark background of the night sky allows the stars to shine brightly to our eyes. 
So a theatrical foil character is one whose qualities, actions, words, or other characteristics bring out and clarify those of another character by contrast. In Hamlet, Laertes' way of seeking revenge for the death of his father makes us the more conscious of Hamlet's way of seeking revenge for the death of his. Laertes' passion is channeled by the king, Hamlet's by the ghost and by his own reason. In Henry IV, Part I, Hotspur's pursuit of honor through battle is a foil for Falstaff's rejection of the very principle of honor. The father-approved affection of Paris for Juliet emphasizes, by contrast, the feud-forbidden passion of Romeo. So Laertes is said to be a foil for Hamlet, Falstaff and Hotspur are foils for one another, and Paris is a foil for Romeo. But being the master he was, Shakespeare transforms this relatively obvious dramatic device into an instrument of great poetic power. What he generally does, more and more thoroughly and subtly as he matures, is not merely to give us a foil character for our main character, but to multiply foils, making them abound in every direction. Falstaff and Hotspur are foils not only for one another, but for the prince, whose truer and deeper honor shines out against their two backgrounds. Though the prince seems to be dishonorable in his friendship with the self-indulgent Falstaff, and, by contrast with the heroically pugnacious Hotspur, in reality Prince Hal's dishonor is only a disguise. Like Hotspur, he also fights and wins but his true honor is shown in his doing so, unlike Hotspur, only for virtuous and noble reasons, rather than for mere personal glory. In Romeo and Juliet, Paris is a foil not only for Romeo, but also for Mercutio and for Benvolio, who are themselves both foils for Romeo and for one another. Old Capulet and Old Montague are foils for one another, but they are also foils for all four of the youthful boys. Juliet's nurse, is a foil for her, for her mother, and for Friar Lawrence. The friar is also a foil for the prince, both trying in different ways to make peace between the feuding families. And the prince, too, is a foil for Romeo, as well as for Old Capulet and Old Montague. This list is not complete. In Hamlet, not only Laertes, but Horatio, Fortinbras, and, in the player's speech, Pyrrhus, are foils for the prince. Old Norway is a foil for Hamlet's father and for Claudius. The priest and gravedigger are foils for one another and for Laertes. Ophelia's real madness is a foil for Hamlet's pretended madness, and Ophelia's innocence for Gertrude's guilt. In King Lear, Gloucester is an obvious foil for Lear. So is the fool. But in addition, Lear's daughters are foils for one another, Gloucester's two sons for one another, and the two sons are foils for the three daughters. Kent and Edgar's disguises are foil for one another, Oswald's corruption for Kent's virtue. I could go on for hours in the vein. In short, Shakespeare's art of composition with characters is such that every character within a play is in some way similar to and in other ways contrasting with every other character. The foil effect works in a myriad ways to sharpen every kind of similarity and difference among the characters. Doesn't this multiplication of foil contrasts produce theatrical and interpretive chaos? No, and the reason it doesn't is unity, as I hope to help you see in the three podcasts of Chapter 6. I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare.